Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. It's been a fantastic set of presentations so far. I'm feeling rather daunted following on from so many knowledgeable speakers, but um, here we go. Um, so, um, introduction to me, really, I've been the diet management officer at ZSL for over 10 years. Um, like Andrea, I'm a generalist, um, so I work for, I look at the diets um, of all taxa, from snails to elephants, and um, I really bow to the amphibian specialists here, so please forgive me if I get anything wrong. So just to set some context of, of what, I, what I do, what I talk about, I work as part of a team which is based in the Wildlife Health Services at London Zoo. Uh, we work collaboratively, but really importantly, we follow evidence-based management practice. And we really want to kind of get that established throughout the zoo, really, for all aspects of um, animal husbandry. And um, we act as a link between the science and the practitioners. Um, some of my work involves doing research um, and also keeping abreast of current research so that we can try and glean new ideas that we can apply um, into our animal feeding management to improve practice. So applied nutrition research is um, absolutely essential to inform animal management decisions around diet and feeding. Um, and these have significant impacts on the viability of ex situ populations. So I'm going to use the mountain chicken frog as a case study to sort of summarize and discuss um, the role that nutrition research has played in improving the health of this threatened species and also how it kind of gets integrated into best husbandry practice. Um, I'm hopefully, well, I'll highlight um, current knowledge gaps, of which there are a lot, so that should be fairly easy. Um, just to let you know, most of the research I'm going to be talking about is it's not it's not my work. Um, there's lots and lots of other people involved. I have been involved with some. I think mountain chicken frogs are very lucky. There's a really active bunch of people um, who really collaborate well to produce some excellent work in this field. So most of you will be familiar with a mountain chicken, but for those of you that aren't, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction. Um, it's an iconic species, it's a very large frog, um, 21 centimetres long, can be 700, to a kilo, 700 grams to um, a kilo in weight. Um, it comes from the Eastern Caribbean, was on a number of islands, but now it's restricted to Dominica and Montserrat. And of course, it's threatened by all the usual suspects. Uh, hunting was a big one um, because it's eaten. Um, then there's habitat loss, which includes farming, uh, volcanic activity, um, and the islands are on, on a hurricane route as well. There's introduced predators, two species of rats, um, there's cats and dogs, as well as um, various um, pigs and goats, um, domestic um, livestock. And then, of course, the big one is disease, which other people have already touched on, the um, fungal disease, chytridomycosis. And this really has caused catastrophic species decline. Um, amazingly, it was documented, but records were being kept at the time because of the hunting that was going on. So we, we do have a, a, a very nice record of exactly how catastrophic this has been. Um, it was first seen on Dominica in 2002, when 85% of the population was lost in less than a year and a half. And then it appeared on Montserrat in 2009 um, and the animals there became functionally extinct. There was just so few of them. So the last wild population estimate is about 100 in 2019 um, and these frogs are um, critically endangered. So um, because of this, obviously, there's been some conservation efforts and um, frogs were brought into captivity earlier than this, but it was really in 2009 that the first big collaborative conservation breeding program um, was initiated. This has since morphed into the Mountain Chicken Recovery Program, uh, which, which is very ambitious and has the laudable aim of having healthy mountain chicken populations across their former ranges um, in Montserrat and Dominica by 2034. So uh, that would be fantastic if that could be achieved. Um, again, as I've already mentioned, big collaborative efforts, as all good conservation programs need to be here. There's lots and lots of people involved in this um, ex situ or, or in many different countries, as well as in situ. So 
appropriate nutrition is absolutely fundamental for the health and the welfare of, of our animals. I mean, they completely rely on us to give them what they need. And they need the correct amount and the correct balance of nutrients. Um, Andrea covered that really well um, a couple of days ago. And of course, it's important for all the animals in our care, but it's especially important for those that are in breeding programs and those that may end up um, going back to the wild. And um, they need to be as fit as possible. So we really need to try and find the um, optimum diet for them. Consequences of poor nutrition, well, we'll see that kind of negatively affect breeding and growth um, and also uh, increase the chance of nutritional disease. And again, this will impact uh, this on the sustainability long term in captivity and our kind of conservation efforts um, to try and get these animals back into the field. One thing to note, really, is with with nutritional disease, especially is, um, as Alan's mentioned, actually, it can take a long time before this becomes clinically evident. Um, so because of that, it's really important to review and evaluate your diet as 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 time progresses, because um, you may not necessarily see anything until it's pretty much too late and then you can't help the frog at all. Another problem that's already been touched on is that this information on what is optimal for um, for this species and many other species um, is that we, we just haven't got that information available. It's just not there. So we're doing some guesstimating. We're looking at model species and, um, you know, some trial and error um, to try and do the best we can. So this is one disease that um, became evident quite early on in the programme. So I'll summarise some of the research which identified and, and then largely resolved this problem. So this nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism is, um, is it's a form of really metabolic bone disease, is a form of this, um, and it results from a lack of calcium, vitamin D, or too much phosphorus, and it affects skeletal health. So this was a project um, that was carried out in 2000, and I think it was 2007, 2008, um, with some captive frogs um, by King and colleagues. And um, these frogs were kept in an ex situ uh, situation, but in Dominica, and 33 of them were radiographed, the whole body. Now, 22 of these were captive bred F1s, um, about two and a half years old, I think, and the others were, um, were wild caught. And what was interesting looking at the results was that the wild caught ones all had very healthy, healthy skeletal structures, no problems at all, but all of the captive bred ones uh, had long bone fractures, decreased bone density and cortical thinning. So not good skeletal health at all. Um, and this could have impacts on their growth, motility, prey acquisition, lots and lots and lots of impacts there on their health. Interestingly, these were all asymptomatic. So here we've got a clear indication of a suboptimal diet. They were being fed gut loaded crickets and they were dusted with supplements that have been, you know, the crickets were dusted with supplements. Um, this wasn't quantified. But as a result of this, really, um, researchers were then trying to think what would resolve this and the focus moved on to vitamin D3 and UVB. So this study was carried out at ZSL. I think uh, from previous speakers now, everyone should know about UVB and the relationship with its um, uh, vitamin D and producing UVB prompting um, de novo synthesis of vitamin D in the amphibian skin. So at London, we had 76 captive reared frogs. Um, these were reared given a UVB gradient of 0 to 3, the 3 on the UVI index there. So um, they had the opportunity to select a little bit where they wanted to go. Um, there was also a gradient of heat and light with this to kind of replicate wild conditions really and give the frogs some choice. You do need to be careful with UVB because um, um, too much effect can cause, cause health problems as well. So these frogs were radiographed, uh, well, 10, a sample of 10 random frogs were radiographed every three months or nine months. And what do we found? That actually they have very, very healthy skeletal growth, normal, healthy, no evidence of breaks, no def deformation, etc. So um, 
this demonstrated that captive reared that we can captive rear frogs with healthy um, skeletons if UV UVB is provided. So the recommendation is, is this is definitely uh, put in the husbandry protocol. This is this is something that that um, should happen when you're looking after frogs, and also that these checks should be radiography checks should be should be carried out fairly regularly so that we can assess the skeletal health, check that our management is working, um, and also check for pre-release fitness when these frogs are released back to the wild. So. In um, this is a recently published uh, review of necropsy findings over the last 20 years. So 212 mountain chicken frogs were included in this analysis. And um, I've picked out some of the findings where nutrition may have an impact. So um, the highest prevalence of pathological findings was in the gastrointestinal and the urinary systems. And just one thing that I know that we've seen in our frogs at London is these um, coleolithiasis, gallbladder stones. Um, so that could be related. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about that later. So inflammatory disease uh, was also the most was the most frequent diagnosis, um, occurring in 48% of these. Uh, dead mountain chickens. Neoplasia was reported in about 20% and intestinal carcinoma caused the death of 15% of the frogs. So again we've seen this, this in our frogs at London um, and um, in, in humans the likelihood of this developing is, is linked to chronic gastrointestinal tract inflammation. So again maybe there's some nutritional link there. Um, so the authors kind of concluded really that the low breeding rate and high mortality threaten the sustainability of the captive frog population. Um, so that's rather worrying. And it, it kind of goes back to this not thriving that Alan, Alan mentioned earlier. Again, looking at the population um, and the size of the population is really a lot of these frogs, they're smaller in size than their wild counterparts and um, they're smaller in weight as well. So these are some graphs from, um, from Zims, which is showing the average, the, the kind of the average weights of frogs at various ages. And you can see, well, you can't see because it's not very good, but they're, you know, about 400 grams is there. Our, our animals, these are the females, they're slightly above 400 and the males are probably around 400 grams. Whereas in the wild, we'd expect them to be at least 700 grams. So, you know, is this a case of not thriving? Is this a case of, of something to do with nutrition or the way they're fed? Or, you know, or is it genetics? We don't know. Nutrition could play a role um, and also in the low breeding success. So we really want these animals to thrive. So uh, at London, we decided to have, a, have another look, kind of go back to basics, really, um, and review the diet. Um, and reference back to the animals natural ecology and we wanted to try and determine the nutritional content of the wild diets as well as our captive ones so that we could compare them and see if there were any big gaps and see if um, there were any recommendations we could make that would kind of improve of husbandry welfare. This was a project that was carried out with Jersey, um, Zoo and Field Partners and lots of collaborators. So if we look at the diet in the wild and the wild feeding strategy, the mountain chicken frog is carnivorous. It's an ambush predator, fit and weight, really. It eats a huge variety of prey species um, and a huge variety of size as well. And as, as speakers have already mentioned, it's pretty much anything it can fit into its mouth, which is quite large. Um, and their activity period is um, crepuscular or nocturnal. So Right, we've got a good starting place, but actually we need to, uh, to know more specifics if we're going to look at the nutrient composition of the diet. So we want to know which food items specifically make up the diet. We need to know what percentage of the diet does each item represent. And we need to know the nutritional composition of each food item. So uh, to do that, we sent someone out. Well, first of all, we looked at some of the research that had already been done um, 
and we're very lucky because Brooks in the 1980s um, published some work documenting the prey that was consumed by the mountain chicken in, in Dominica. So what he did was he, he went and collected frogs two to five hours after dark, euthanized them, and then uh, examined the stomach contents and calculated the percentage dry weight of each group that were in the, in, in the animal stomachs. Now he did this over, um, over the whole year. So he has seasonal data as well. But what we did was we, we compiled this into just an average over the year. And we've grouped them loosely in various taxonomic groups. So you can see here though that the, the vast uh, majority, nearly 50% of the, of the dry weight of diet is, um, is um, orthoptera, is crickets and katydids. Um, and then snails feature quite highly, soft-bodied snails um, and slugs as well. Um, and then it goes on through the other insect orders really to uh, even um, some vertebrates down here, which make up a small percentage of the total weight. So we know the food items and we know the percentage of, it, of, of, of each in the diet, thank you to Brooks. Um, but we needed to um, work out the nutritional composition. So the uh, lead author, Steph Jason, she went out to Montserrat to collect, um, to collect these invertebrates um, and euthanize them. And then they were frozen and brought back to the UK to be analyzed. Uh, all, you know, we went through, we followed our usual uh, due diligence ethical review process. Um, it's challenging to get the amount that we need to do the analysis. So uh, we managed to, all those ones in blue, we managed to get the right amount able to do the analysis. Uh, the ones highlighted in red, the vertebrates, we didn't really want to do because of our ethical um, guidelines. Um, and the others were just too small really to, to get enough of. So, but altogether we did, we managed to get um, the food items that compromised about 90% of the, um, of the dry weight of the stomach contents. So they all came back to England. At, uh, it was quite a faff getting them back, but, um, but they came back to England and uh, ready to go to the lab. So then the captive diet. So what's our captive diet? Well, it's, um, it's very, very few species of commercially available invertebrates with a bit of supplement. Um, but again, we need to answer the same questions uh, the same questions like which foods make up the diet what's the percentage of each and what's the composition of those one thing that's important to note is that what you offer your animals isn't always what they eat um, so it, that depends on the species it it, it, it may be different um, but it's it's important really to if you're doing a diet analysis to be as robust as possible and to get what the animals are actually eating so um, for that, we did an intake study um, over a period of 21 days at London Zoo. So what we did was we weighed the amount of food item in the diet that's offered and the amount left over after each feeding session. Then the difference obviously is what has been eaten. Um, if we're looking at omnivores, you'd have to do some desiccation, but uh, put a desiccation factor in there, but we didn't need to do that for these um, for these crickets because it was live food that was being fed. So um, the length of time you choose to do this for depends on the frequency of your feeding schedule. So uh, we weren't feeding every day, so um, we need to do it over quite a long period, and then we can get the results and average them for a daily intake even but it doesn't mean the animals were fed every time. So if, um, if you want to know more about doing an intake study, um, the B BIOSA, which is a British Institute Association of British Zoos, British and Irish Zoos, um, has produced a handbook of zoo research. And there's a, a big chapter there on nutrition and diet evaluation, which is, is worth looking at. Okay, so these were the animals on the menu at, uh, at London. Um, and these are the results of what was what was um what was eaten by them. So we uh, we did this over three weeks, um, and these are the results um, in terms of the average eaten per day. So they wouldn't necessarily get a locust every day; they would maybe get it once a week. But um, on average per day, these are the figures we need um, in order to put into our diet analysis. 
um, you can see that again, there's a, there's a heavy reliance, nearly all, of the, you know, vast percentage of the animals we were feeding um, is is um, orthoptera again, but it, it's kind of gone right up to about 70% then, and 30% was some sun beetle grubs. Uh, we didn't actually feed any Argentinian cockroach at that time or over that period. So we know how much um, they're eating and we know which species they're eating. And um, I mean, total was just over three grams per frog per day. So now we need to get the nutritional composition of these food items. So we did exactly the same thing. We collected, um, collected them, euthanized them, froze them, and they went off to the same laboratory um, with the samples that came back from Montserrat. So these are the nutrients that we had measured in our invertebrate samples. It's quite expensive running these analyses and um, it requires a lot of invertebrate material. Um, so we were constrained by money and sample size. Um, and we did, we managed to do most of these on most of the samples. There is more details in the paper if you want to um, find out a bit more about the kind of caveats to them. Um, to this. So when the composition results were back from the laboratory, uh, they were entered onto the nutrition database here, and then we pressed some buttons and did some calculations and uh, got the nutrient composition of the complete diet. So these are some of our results, I'm just going to go through some of them. So this was our unsupplemented captive diet um, compared to the wild diet, and we've got um, Jersey, Durrell, and um, London and then the wild. So, you, and it's all expressed in dry matter terms. So we can see that the energy content um, of it's the captive diets have nearly double the energy content of the wild diet. And the captive diets have three or four times as much fat as in the wild diet. So, you know, it does make me think I've no idea, but is this again related to the um, adenocarcinomas? Don't know. Moving on to the minerals, um, again, the, the, the um, ash, there's, there's very little ash compared to the wild diet, about a quarter of what's in the wild diet. We have very low calcium carbon, calcium content compared to the wild, which is no surprise, you know, really knowing we already know that these invertebrates are very low in calcium or commercially produced invertebrates are very low in calcium. And um, and again, the uh, the phosphorus remains fairly similar throughout all of those diets, um, but that obviously results in a, in an inverse cutting to phosphorus ratio in our captive diets if they're not supplemented. Vitamin A, it was below measurable level in all, even the wild diets. So. Um, all the wild items so we couldn't measure vitamin a so it does make you wonder you know where are they getting it from in the wild um possibly carotenoids or, or maybe the occasional invertebrate feed um is enough to store enough vitamin a don't know and vitamin e very variable actually so um uh the um the diet at Jersey, it was very high, the vitamin E, um, and, and, and at London was very low, and the wild one was, was somewhere in the middle. So I'm not sure what's happening there. Possibly it's due to the different feeds that the um, feeder invertebrates were given at Durrell. Okay, just having a closer look at the fat and the composition of it. And if we split the fat into saturates, monounsaturates and polyunsaturates, there seems to be similar amounts of each of these in, in both the captive diets and the wild diet. However, when we look more closely at the fatty acids, um, there's, uh, there's more differences really that may, be, um, that may be significant. So we've got two families of essential fatty acids, the um, omega-6s and the omega-3s. And you probably will have heard just from, from human nutrition really, the omega-3 fatty acids, and, which is which is this one here, um, alpha linolenic acid, um, and there's longer chain derivatives as well. But these have a number of health benefits. Certainly, it's been well documented in humans. Um, so they um, mediate the in inflammatory response. 
um, thought to prevent heart disease, and they may play a protective role um, against cancers. And um, the ratio of the omega-6 to omega-3 is quite important. I know Andrea and Dennis mentioned this um, in their talks. So it's very interesting to see that here, you know, there's a big difference between the wild, um, which has much more of these omega-3s than the captive diets. And conversely, for the omega-6s, these are much more at high, much higher levels in the captive diets than in the wild diet. So, so that's a big, huge difference in diet, really, and um, in content. And the ratio of the wild diet is um, 2.4 to 1, and the ZSL diet is about 17 to 1. Um, so to, to just compare that with humans, really, in the Western world, actually, we it's about the same. We have a 15 to 16 to 1 ratio um, in our diet. And actually, we should be looking at about 4. So the wild diet is lower than 4. So that's, you, you know, this. I think this could be quite significant and have um, implications for diseases. Again, uh, may, maybe adenocarcinoma, it may affect that. But again, that's just supposition. So. So the summary, and this is the unsupplemented diet again, um, really are dry matter in the captive diets, they're higher in dry matter intake, gross energy and crude fat, and the omega-6 fatty acid, linolenic acid. And the captive diets lower in ash, calcium, calcium phosphorus ratio, and the linolenic acid, which is the omega-3. And they were very similar for the protein and the amino acids, uh, the ratio of the fat saturation and vitamin A, um, but variable for vitamin E. So I think um, highlights really that we want to try and change the composition of our, our prey items really. Um, and we would kind of like them to be low in fat, low in energy and higher in the omega-3 fatty acids. So and we can certainly this last one with the omega-3 fatty acids there's been some research published Dennis touched on this in his talks because this is work he's done um, where you can manipulate the content of these omega-3 fatty acids if you in in a number of um, feeder species the house cricket lesser mealworm and the black soldier fly by including flaxseed oil which is very high in alpha linolenic acid in the diet of these, um, it does affect the amount of N3 and therefore the, re the ratio. And you can see quite quickly, um, it drops to what we say is the level that's quite, um, that's advised really for human being health. Um, at, if it's included at 2% of the diet, it, it, it then um, alters that ratio. So it's quite favorable in terms of health. So that's that's something that, that we're kind of interested in, and we may try and, and have, a, have, a, have a look at that. So with this same work, we also wanted to quantify the supplementation. We, we needed to quantify it for the diet analysis. Um, and also we wanted to make sure that we were giving sufficient, but not actually not overdosing. And in the end, you know, they're quite concentrated. Um, so some, some of the uh, some of the nutrients may be, may be toxic in, in big doses and, and we want to save money as well. So um, this, is, this is the way we did it. We, we put our feeder insects into a bag, we put our measured amount of um, supplement in the bag and um, shook them around a bit and then released the feeder insects into the enclosures and then measured the supplement that was left in. Um, And this is this is the amount really. We we used um, a mixture of nutrivol and calcium carbonate. Um, um, as you can see, we, we've we've got the measurements there. As it's quite a small amount. What was interesting that about about two thirds of it stuck to the prey, and about a third of it was was wasted. So we've got that that ratio now that we used, and we averaged that across the different feeder insects. So um, it may be different for um, it may be different for different stages, and it may be different for for different species. Um, Michael did some work looking at how effective 
supplement was at, at, at staying on after um, after animals have been feeder animals have been dusted and then fed to um, to the prey fed to the um, sorry the mammoth chickens. So we're going to assume in our calculations with of the supplemented diet we're going to assume that all of this lot was eaten in reality um, some was probably lost. Uh, the other interesting thing that this uh, bit of work highlighted really was that there's a, quite a different practice at the different institutions uh, using different uh, vitamin supplementation for dusting so um, it would be interesting to look at that at some stage so with the supplementation we can see that calcium level has increased it's gone up to 3.9 percent um, but it's still below that that we measured in in the wild diet phosphorus stays about the same and it's about the same level as in the wild diet as well um, of course because the calcium has increased and the phosphorus has stayed the same we've got a much better um, calcium to phosphorus ratio it's still not as high as the wild diet and the wild diet's high um, you know most vertebrates you'd expect a two to one ratio so yeah they have been, they're, they're having a lot of calcium in the wild they may not be digesting it all it may be not in a form that they can um that they could use it may not be bioavailable or it may be physically just not able to be digested so i, I think again that's something that's interesting to look at um of course, when you look at vitamin A, we couldn't this is below the limits of detection um, when the diet was not supplemented. But when with dusted insects, of course, we then had, um, you know, we could we could then register. We got a measurement for that. So, uh, so it's interesting. Yeah, I think um, there's there's more questions and work to be done with vitamin A. Um, is is that okay at that level? We haven't seen any signs of any problems with vitamin A, but I think it's just worth bearing in mind that may, they may be getting the vitamin A in a different form in these captive diets when they're supplemented. So, as I said, cal calcium is still a bit odd, isn't it? We've got, you know, if we don't have, if we have too little, we get metabolic bone disease. If we have too much, well, maybe we're getting other problems. Um, because we seem to be giving them or they seem to need more than the generic kind of um, levels that we'd expect vertebrates to have and be healthy. So these, um, these are the gallbladder stones that we've seen in our frogs. Um, and one concern because these have, we've looked at um, a few of these and they're composed of calcium carbonate. So, you know there is a concern are we over supplementing the frogs because we do see quite a lot of these oh. so this was a project we did we trialed two different calcium supplement regimes for the mountain chickens um and the aim was to provide an evidence base oops, to inform um, our supplementation regimes so um i'm not going to talk about calcium metabolism because i'm sure you all know that by now but just to point out that um, there's a special organ in frogs. Um, these are the paraventral, um, paravertebral endolymphatic sacs, and these act as calcium stores. And you can see this one here, if you radiograph them, you can see the calcium stores um, in those sacs. So this is our study design. It's, we designed, um, yeah, we designed this to look at the impacts of a high and a low calorie, um, a, a low, calcium dusting regime so we had 12 frogs and we siblings and we split them into two groups of six and they were on a high put on a high or a low ca um, calcium uh, regime all frogs were fed daily but the high cow group received dusting every feed and the low cow group received supplement on two feeds per week these were juveniles um, the supplement was a combination of nutribol and calcium carbonate powder so then we took a, a number of um, measurements of their mass, their snout vent length um, and biometrics and did radiographs at, at regular intervals throughout this. And by day 167, we put 
both frogs, we reviewed the data and for reasons you'll see, we then designed a new um, treatment, which was midway between these two. So we look at the results. So for the first stage with the, um, the high versus low calcium diets, we can see that the, um, there was no differences on day naught. So therefore any changes we can ascribe to the treatments. Um, the calcium facts were substantially and significantly more opaque, um, so it indicates there's more calcium in them. The skulls of those on the high calorie diet, on the high um, calcium diet, were significantly broader relative to their length than those that were given low calcium. And also, the calcium content of the feces of the high calorie group was um, high calcium. High calcium group was um, double that of the low calcium group. There was no other differences noted. So in the second phase, um, because of those changes, we moved them all onto a kind of medium, um, medium calcium level diet. Um, so, and what happened was that the skulls evened out, they became they became the same and it was that the, the ones on the low calcium diet kind of caught up with the others and the calcium storage sacs um, became intermediate and um, equalized as well um, so no other differences were found um, but this is the in comparison with captive sorry ca yeah comparing the captive and the wild diets all captive frogs had narrower skulls and thinner femora than the wild frogs. So they, they literally, they just weren't as, um, they weren't as robust. So um, high calcium may, sorry, the um, over and under supplementation is possible and that the fecal excretion uh, suggests that probably too much calcium in the high calcium diet. So the, the um, Feeding a medium level of calcium supplementation kind of preserved the high calcium effects of the skeleton, but it allowed the uh, low calcium frogs to catch up. And at no point were there any clinical signs. There was no hypocalcemia. I looked at from the blood sample. However, we, we do wonder if, the, if, they, if they were put under any stress, they may have been compromised. Um, and the frogs differed from wild animals. Our captive frogs were definitely less robust. Um, and this really led to making a recommendation that these calcium sacs saturations should be, sorry, should be tested prior to translocation, um, as well as being part of generalised health checks. And we really need more data on this um, to look at the differences between the wild and the captive, and what the long term effects may be of feeding this, this quite high calcium level. And this is related research um, into coleothiasis um, and the gallbladder stones. And, and it, was, it was aimed to further the understanding and management of, of this condition in, in our captive chickens. Um, clinical signs associated with this have been reported to the European or the, the, the European Endangered Species Programme vets. Um, and these include hyperexia anorexia and poor body condition. So quite non-specific, but, um, but could be associated with this condition. Um, there also may be pain associated. We know in humans this is incredibly painful. Um, so really from a welfare point of view, we do need to investigate and monitor it in these uh, mountain chickens because we know it occurs fairly frequently. So this research, um, with a retrospective study looking at 133 mountain chickens that had died over the six years at Zolotel. Um, and ultrasonic images, radiographic images, and histo histopathology samples were looked at for all these um, for all these mountain chickens. And a scoring system was was developed which to evaluate changes in the bladders here, going from like not much at all to um, this is at the higher end when this formation solid stones. Um, so the results of that really were that the ultrasound showed higher sensitivity. Um, so going forward, that's that's the method that we'd recommend to um, 
uh, for monitoring this in a standardized way in the mountain chickens. Um, 38% of them did show an abnormality in the gallbladder of some sort, and, and the three stones that, that were looked at were 95% calcium carbonate. So again, I think you know this condition needs more research in the species and probably related to our diet. So moving on to something slightly different, but we at London Zoo two years ago, colleagues set up an in-house invertebrate live food production unit, which sounds very very impressive but it's um which it's fantastic it's just one room um but it's been extremely useful for us it enables um us to carry out research on, on manipulating the diet of these animals and looking at the effects on their nutrient composition um it's given us a lot more control over overall management of the feeder invertebrates um, and and it's, it's allowing us to conduct investigations or tr trial out procedures that other researchers have done and published um, and in laboratories, etc. So we can see if they'd work in a, you know, in a very practical setting to help the kind of um, the actual kind of on the ground management of these species. So one of the first things we wanted to look at was vitamin D. Um, and um, on Wednesday, Dennis gave a great presentation on some of his research, and he found that if you irradiated um, a number of commonly used feeder in insects with UVB, they will synthesize vitamin D de novo, and you can increase the amount of vitamin D in these insects and then feed them to your precious mountain chickens. The amount of vitamin D depended on um, the irradiance level and the exposure duration. So um, the black bars are, are the ones when once they were irradiated and you can very clearly see that um, there's an increase. This is at a low irradiance and this is at a higher irradiance and you can see it's quite, you know, it's quite dramatic, actually. So this was quite exciting to us and we wanted to see if we could replicate this in a practical situation. So in our lovely new unit, we we um, got a student and, and did this. We used um, adult um, uh, field crickets, um, gorillas by meticulatus. So we we um, bred a, a lot of crickets. We took, took them at adult stage. We fasted them for 24 hours and then took a sample to thanks the baseline. We then split the group into two. One of them had uh, exposure to UVB and the other one had no exposure. Um, and then they were gut loaded. So a given nutrigrub and they were um, given the, under this condition for 48 hours. We took samples after 24 hours and after 48 hours. Then the crickets were taken out again and they were fasted for 24 hours to empty the gut um, and then more samples were taken at that stage. This is really to kind of look at what happens if you give them to the in the real life situation if you give them to the animals and they don't eat them for a while. So, um, so these are our results. We've got uh, calcium at the top here and phosphorus at the bottom. Um, the controls with no UV are in red um, and the blue it, it, were exposed to UVB. So uh, there was no detectable levels of vitamin D at any stage. Um, and there was no effect on calcium accumulation rate between uh, the two groups. Um, we know what the peak calcium is and the calcium to phosphorus ratio. And um, it's kind of worth noting that ne neither of these, I mean, this is what we're feeding our, 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 our mountain chickens, but ne it, they're not reaching the values that are sufficient to maintain healthy and calcium metabolism in vertebrates. So, you know, it, it shows the value of, of dusting. We have to dust as well as has got load. Um, and once once the crickets uh, had no food, um, the, the all that calcium which had accumulated um, uh, within has gone within twenty four hours. So you can see here that the calcium um, increased over twenty four and forty eight hours um, when they were gut loaded, but then it just disappeared again. So uh, 
concluding for that, uh, uh, that amount of uh, irradiation, that level and that duration um, it, it, and that species, um, that it, it didn't work for vitamin D synthesis. Um, so, and our supplementary dusting is essential if we're going to make recommendations or, or recommendations as we think. Um, and also, importantly, we need to ensure that the players prey um, is rapidly consumed because um, you've got loaded benefits are voided out fairly quickly. Now, we were still interested in vitamin D, um, and, and we thought maybe we just didn't do it for long enough. So, so we did something slightly different. We got a load of hatchlings, we bred our hatchlings and split them into two groups. And one group was given UVB um, and one group was not. And this was until they reached adult stage two throughout their whole growing period. Um, and once they'd reached adulthood, we then took, split them again into males and females from each um, from each of the groups, from each of the treatment groups, split them into um, males and females. And then those, we fasted them for 24 hours and then samples of each were taken for analysis. So, so what results did we get? Well, still, 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 the vitamin D was below detectable levels and this was our detectable level. So it was lower than that. Now, something may have been going on, uh, you know, lower than that level, but it probably, it's not really meaningful because, um, because it's a very, very low anyway. It's not, it's, it's not, it's not, you know, we need to be much higher than that to be a mean more. To, if we compare um, estimated vertebrate requirements, they're over one international year per gram. So, um, you know, anything happening below 0 0.5 isn't really meaningful to us anyway. Uh, I mean, it's interesting to note that the cricket performance uh, was different. The UVB crickets, the crickets that didn't have, that weren't exposed to UVB, they grew larger, but there was fewer adults produced. We don't know why this is um, uh, possibly a density dependent growth, but, it, you know, it gives us possibly a tool to, to produce either larger crickets or more crickets, depending on what we want for our um, insectivores. What was interesting, though, was the mineral content, because we looked at the minerals, um, a suite of minerals um, as well. And what we found was that, on average, these were broadly similar to other studies. Um, although, you know, there's quite a wide variation um, within the other studies as well, probably due to the different species and the different diets that they're being fed. Um, but all of them, all of these minerals reach the minimum recommendation for vertebrate growth, um, apart from calcium. What was really interesting, though, was that we noticed really strong sex differences. Uh, you probably can't see this very well, but the, the females are in red and you can see there's big gaps. Um, so they're quite different from the male for some of these um, for some of these minerals. And actually, females contain double the amount of calcium, magnesium, phosphorus and copper compared to males. So this, um, so what we really found out from this, of course, was that actually even for this species, uh, UVB radiation throughout the life cycle is just not effective at raising vitamin D to meaningful levels. So the cost of the equipment and the energy used um, is just not justified. And we really need to explore other options to make sure that the vitamin D uh, requirement is satisfied. Um, because our sexes have different nutrient composition, um, we need to be aware of this because if animals don't have access to both sexes, I mean, one would think if you're feeding, you're going to give an equal amount of males and females, but there may be situations when that doesn't happen. Um, so, for example, in some reintroduction programs, when animals are kind of in situ, um, in country, um, you may not want to feed females um, in case they escape. and um, um naturalize so um so in that case if you're just feeding one the males that you're going you know you're going to skew your diet and and you you know you need to be aware of that in case it has any implications um same also in terms of size if you have such a dimorphic prey items um and 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 then you have smaller um 
species, species which need smaller animals, you may just give them all the small ones, which all the females or something. So um, you need to be aware of that discrepancy. Plan for it. So coming coming just back to a kind of a practical note again, I think it's really important to um, when you're comparing for any species, you need to look at the animals in front of you uh, really carefully and what and what they're eating if you're reviewing diets. I've got a standard list of checkpoints here for just seeing how an animal's responding to the to the diet that you're feeding. So um, appetite in, intake, that's really important. And it's really important to document it and measure it. Um, you know, the number of times you know, I will have two people telling me completely different things about what an animal's eating. So, uh, so that's really important. Weighing animals are important. It tells you a lot about their health. Um, it, it's much more powerful if you can body condition score as well. I mean, um, body condition score is is really a way of objectively looking at the animal and assessing its kind of fat and um, and muscle coverage. And um, I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, if you can, if you can find the feces, um, if you can look at fecal score again, that, that that tells you quite a bit about about how well the animal's digesting its food. We also look at behaviour um, because behaviour, yeah, it can be quite powerful um, in telling us what not telling us directly, but what's happening really in terms of nutrition and feeding behaviour. Reproduction, it's important if they're not reproducing, it's really bad. I mean, animals can reproduce on pretty rubbish diets, but so, um, you know, you need to be aware of that, but it's still, it's another thing to look at. And of course, veterinary interventions, um, you know, the less the vets are involved and um, the less stress and um, welfare of the animals, um, the, the better really. So just to help you with that, um, this, Body condition score was developed for mountain chicken frogs um, and it was published a few years ago. And again, it's, it's just a really useful management tool, really, and it informs us the health of the animal. Um, in that paper I mentioned earlier about um, kind of the, 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 the review of retrospective um, and necropsies of uh, mountain chickens, you know, over 50% of the frogs were thin. So, you know, it's if you can check their body condition, you may be able to, to understand, grab, you may be able to intervene a little bit earlier um, when something's going wrong. So this objective scoring, it looks at the deposition of uh, fat and muscle. And um, of course you could, you can do it without handling them. So, um, so it's much less stressful. So to sum up really, um, applied nutrition research, I hope, I hope I, what, I, what I've, I've, I've talked about, you can see that it's essential um, to inform nutritional management decisions. And these decisions do have high value impacts on the health, the welfare, population sustainability, and our conservation outcomes. So, uh, so we, we really need lots of, lots of nutrition research and, um, and, and to watch our animals closely. Mountain chicken frogs still has health problems um, and they may be linked to nutrition. Um, and anyone looking after animals can do this evidence-based nutrition research on any scale. So I would urge everyone to collaborate, document and share. So some of the uh, further applied research, uh, there's lots, but really that I think I would be interested in looking at really is we really need to look at our live food quality and really try and get that lower fat and lower um, um, energy food for these animals. Um, I want to do some following uh, Dennis's work. I'd kind of like to do a little bit more work on um, trying to increase the omega-3 content. We have started some, but uh, the animals didn't like the food very much, so we're going to have to reformulate that. Um, and then I still think, you know, there's quite a lot of work to do with calcium, really, what the optimal um, content of the diet should be, what form it's in, and um, how digestible it is. Um, Ellen Durenfeld did some work with the mountain chickens and um, calci worms. The calci worms are lauded as being, you know, very high in calcium. And, um, and she looked at the digestibility of them. And uh, if they're whole, they're basically not really digested very well at all. If they're, if they're mashed up, then they are digested. So and we fed them at London and they've certainly passed through the mountain chickens and what looks like being undigested. So, you know, so 
so we have to look at these things we have to keep an open mind we have to experiment but we have to kind of document and um and share that information so that we can continue to uh, manage our animals in the best way that we can and that's it thank you very much to for listening and to all these um wonderful people that have um that we've been working with with some of these projects <laughs>